We turn in God's Word this afternoon to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? O my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. But be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him, and fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. All they that be fat upon earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him and none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this. This is God's word, holy and inspired. May he bless it to our hearts this afternoon. Our text is verse 22. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Beloved congregation in our Lord Jesus Christ, if you would take a moment to look around the congregation, what would you see? What would you see? 
If you looked around the congregation, you might see a row of your family. You might see your friends and brethren in the Lord. Faces that you know. People that you love. When you look with the eye of faith, what you see right in the middle of the congregation is Jesus Christ. He's there. He's sitting right there. He's sitting there. He has a seat. It's the seat next to you. It's the seat on your right hand. It's the seat on your left hand. The Lord Jesus Christ is right here in the midst of His church. He says so. He says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. That's Jesus' word. That's Jesus' word about the worship this evening. That's Jesus' word about the congregation in all of her life. Jesus' word about the church is, I am in the midst of her. And the Lord Jesus Christ says that as the one who hung upon the cross. He says that as the one whose garments were parted by the wicked men who crucified Him. He says that as the one whose hands and whose feet were pierced. As Jesus sings Psalm 22, as He sings, My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken Me? As He sings, They parted My garments among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. As he sings, they pierced my hands and my feet. As he sings, I am a worm and no man. He sings all of that for your sake, as your Savior, who was crucified, died, buried, and was raised again and ascended into heaven, that he might sit in your midst as the congregation, and that he might worship Jehovah not only with you, but that He might worship Jehovah for you. And that's the Gospel. That's the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of the great congregation. And that's the word of the Lord that we consider this evening as using as our theme, Jesus in the great congregation. In the first place, we consider the meaning In the second place, we consider the worship. And in the third place, the testimony. Jesus in the great congregation. The meaning, the worship, and the testimony. In the text, our Lord speaks of a congregation and a couple of verses later of a great congregation. In fact, the congregation and the great congregation. When Jesus speaks of the congregation and the great congregation. He means the church. That is what he is speaking of. He says, my brethren are in the church, and I am in the midst of my brethren in the church. And he calls that church the congregation. He calls that church the assembly. The church to which Jesus refers can be defined as the assembly of the elect. That's the congregation. It is the assembly of the elect. Jesus indicates that it is an assembly when He speaks of it as the congregation. The congregation is that body that is gathered together in an assembly. That congregation or that body that congregates together. And that assembly, that congregation, is the work of Jehovah who takes His church even as many as He has called, and gathers them together out of the world and unites them together as the body of the Lord Jesus Christ so that the church of Christ is that assembly, that assembly of the elect. And Jesus indicates that the church is the assembly of the elect when He says about them, they are My brethren. Jesus doesn't say that about all men. Jesus doesn't say about the reprobate that they are His brethren. They are not His brethren. They are His enemies. They are those against whom He prays in this psalm and in many of the psalms that God would destroy them and that God would deliver Him from them. 
Those bulls, those mighty bulls of Bashan who compassed him around. Those dogs who gnashed upon him. Jesus doesn't call them brethren, not the reprobate. He calls on the, the elect his brethren. So that Jesus here himself defines and describes the congregation, the great congregation, the church, as the assembly of the elect. And that doctrine of the church, which is Jesus' own doctrine of the church in the passage, shows that this truth of election is the heart of the church. God's good pleasure from all eternity and his decree from all eternity, choosing as his own, as many as he willed, choosing them by name to be his own, not according to anything that they had done, but according to his own good pleasure, that truth of election is the heart of the church. And that is the way our confessions define the church also. Lord's Day 21 of the Heidelberg Catechism, question 54, What believest thou concerning the holy Catholic Church of Christ? That the Son of God, from the beginning to the end of the world, gathers, defends, and preserves to himself by his spirit and word out of the whole human race a church chosen to everlasting life, agreeing in true faith, and that I am and forever shall remain a living member thereof. The Reformed Confession on the basis of this text and the whole word of God is that the heart of the church is election and that the church is the assembly of the elect. Now that is a great consolation for the church because the whole world of dogs and bulls and wicked men and unicorns and all of those who have horns to pierce and hooves to stamp and teeth to rend, all of the enemies of the church of Jesus Christ cannot remove the church from the love of God. They cannot overthrow you. They cannot remove you from the assembly of the elect and from the gathering and congregating, removed from the world and brought near unto God by all of their wicked devices. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is safe and secure in her election by God and by His own good pleasure. When they next gnash on you with their teeth and hate you with their slanders against you, then you remember, but I am and forever shall remain a living member of the assembly of the elect. And whatever they say, God has said, you're mine. You're mine in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the truth of the church. It's the assembly of the elect. And that means, too, that the church that throws off, the institution, that is, that throws off the truth of election, the institution that becomes bored with that doctrine of election and becomes the foe of election and begins to make all her theology proceed from man and not from election, that church will wreck the doctrine of the church as well. And that institution will wreck the comfort and the peace of God's people and open them up to all of the snares of the wicked who would rend them. The truth of the church is that it is the assembly of the elect. That's the congregation. That's the brethren that Jesus speaks of in the text. Now when Jesus defines and describes the church that way as the assembly of the elect, he teaches that the church is a spiritual institution. The church is a spiritual institution. The church is the assembly of the elect. The church is the congregation gathered by the Word and the Spirit of Jesus Christ out of the whole human race. When Jesus teaches that the church is a spiritual institution, the assembly of the elect, then Jesus rules out that the church can ever be defined or described 
as a carnal or a physical thing. The church may not be defined physically. It may not be. It cannot be. The church may not and cannot be de- defined according to carnal considerations. It is a spiritual institution. It is the congregation gathered by Christ by His Word and Spirit that's spiritual. It is the congregation made up of His brethren, united to Him by faith. The body of the Lord, the assembly of the elect. That's spiritual. The church may not be defined or described as a physical thing. It may not be defined and described by her building. It may not be. Is not that the first lesson about the church we teach our children? What is the church? We ask them. And teach them it is not the building. It is not the building. That's not the church. We call that building the church, but that's not the church. The church is the assembly of the elect. It's the members of the body of Christ who belong to Him by faith. That's the church. And has not God driven that home to this congregation and to the whole denomination that the church is not physical and may not be defined by the building. What is your building, Ben? A living room? A garage? A community center here and a community center there? What has the building been for the denomination? A barn? Tire shops? A construction shed? A building? What has the building been? For you and throughout the denomination, the Lord has shown us the church is not physical. It's not carnal. The church may not be defined that way. It's the assembly of the elect. Because only in defining it as that spiritual entity is the church Christ's. He's the one who gathers it by His Word and Spirit. He's the one who defends by His Word and Spirit that church. He's the one who preserves her by His Word and Spirit. He's the one that unites her to Himself. That's the church. And even when we describe the assembling of the church, that assembling of the church is spiritual. That assembling of the church is not defined by the confines of the building so that only those who fit within the confines of the building are in the church or are in the worship before Jehovah God or are in the assembly of the elect. Our confessions teach that in striking, striking language that the church is spiritual. The confessions in the Belgic Confession Article 23 use the very words of, uh, of uh, the text with congregation. Article 27, rather, of the Belgic Confession. The Catholic Christian Church. We believe and profess one Catholic or universal church which is a holy congregation of true Christian believers, all expecting their salvation in Jesus Christ being washed by His blood, sanctified and sealed by the Holy Ghost. The confessions teach about the congregation, the holy congregation, that is the holy assembly of the elect, that this is a universal and Catholic church, that it is true Christian believers expecting their salvation in Jesus Christ. That's spiritual. Everything about that is spiritual. The church, the congregation of which the Lord speaks here is the assembly of His elect in Him. There is nothing in the identity of the church, even in her assembly, that is physical and carnal. 
the church, even in her assembling and congregating, is spiritual. Who sang that psalm after all? Didn't David? Isn't this a psalm of David? What did David see with regard to the congregation and the great congregation? There is the tabernacle. Someday to be replaced with a temple. There is the tabernacle. And here come all the tribes of Israel on the great day of atonement or on the Passover feast. And all the tribes of Israel come together. Could you define that assembly as the physical confines of a building? Or the physical confines of a patch of ground? There's no way to do that. You couldn't do that. And yet David says, I will make thy praise known in the midst of the great congregation. Jesus speaks of, or David speaks rather, of that assembly as that spiritual gathering by the Word and Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that makes the lie that is currently ripping through the Reformed Protestant churches so deadly and evil. The lie that the church is defined by her building. And that if there are members who for one reason or another cannot fit or cannot come into a certain prescribed space, that they are in another assembly, a different assembly, a second assembly of the church. Inherent in that doctrine, aside even from the legalism, which will kill the whole denomination, aside even from that legalism, inherent in that doctrine is the carnality of the church. That the church is essentially, in some essential respect, a physical entity. And you try to find that in the confessions. You can't do it. You won't be able to do it. The congregation is the assembly of the elect. That spiritual entity, that is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, manifest in the congregation. The Lord Jesus Christ speaks of His church. He speaks of His congregation as the assembly of His brethren, as the congregation of His brethren. What is striking in the psalm is that Jesus says about that assembly, that congregation, that He is in the midst of her. The Lord Jesus Christ says that. This is a psalm of David, but it is not David's psalm, ultimately. It is the psalm of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's true of all the psalms. All of the psalms are the songs of Jesus Christ. And they are the songs of Jesus Christ in the first place because He is the one who wrote them. The Spirit of Jesus Christ inspired these psalms. So that in the Psalms, it is the Lord Jesus Christ who is speaking. In some respect, and that's the exciting exegetical work, the exciting interpretive work to do in the Psalms, to see how it is that the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking throughout all the Psalms. It's the Spirit of the Lord who inspired those Psalms so that these are His own songs. And they're the songs of the Lord in the second place because... When He came in our flesh and lived among us, these are the songs He sang. These are the songs He sang at the Passover. These are the songs He sang in the synagogue. These are the songs He sang in His home. These are the songs of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Psalms are His. That's especially clear in Psalm 22 where you cannot even hear David half the time. You cannot even figure out what David is talking about half the time from his own life and his own history. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Psalm 22 opens. You don't hear David in that. You hear Christ. That's Jesus Christ. On the cross, when 
God drew the veil of the darkness of His curse and wrath over the cross and pressed upon Him the whole curse against our sins. The Lord cried out, My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? He sang Psalm 22. He sang about His hands and feet being pierced. He sang about His garments being divided. The Lord sang Psalm 22. He sang the victory of Psalm 22. When he sang in verse 22, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. That comes at the end of that whole section of his lament. The whole section of his song, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the Lord, having poured out his wrath upon the Lord Jesus Christ and sustaining him so that he bore it all away, the Lord Jesus Christ sang, I live. And I will sing thy praise in the midst of the congregation. And I will make known thy name among my brethren. That's the Lord's song. And as if that were not clear enough, in Hebrews 2, the inspired writer says in verse 11 and 12, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he, that is Jesus, is not ashamed to call them, that is us, brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And there the inspired writer of Hebrews is saying, Psalm 22 is Jesus' psalm. He's the one who says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. He's the one who says, in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. That's Jesus speaking. When we sing Psalm 22, we are singing the very words of Jesus Christ Himself. We're singing His own song. And His own song. Jesus says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. And by that, Jesus says to His church, I'm in your midst. I'm right in your midst, you congregation of my brethren, you assembly of the elect of Jehovah God. I am in your midst. I'm next to you. I'm on the seat to the left of you and the seat to the right of you. I am here with you. I'm behind you and I'm before you. I am in the great congregation. I'm right in her midst. And you see what that means regarding the worship of the church. It means that Jesus is the worshiper in the church. Did you know that about Jesus? Jesus is the worshiper in the church. The one who is worshiping God in the church is Jesus Christ. We think of Him as the one being worshipped. And that's true with regard to all the members of the body. We worship Jesus Christ. But the worshiper in the church is Jesus Christ. He's in the midst of the congregation. He is the one declaring God's name to the congregation. He is the one singing the praises of the name of God in the midst of the congregation. Jesus Christ is the worshiper in the church. He is the one in the church who worships Jehovah God, the triune God, who has the man Jesus Christ come in our flesh, crucified, dead, raised, and ascended into heaven, worships Jehovah God now and forever. And when the church in her assembling and the church in her congregating and the church in her worshiping of Jehovah gathers for that worship, Jesus Christ is the one who worships God. I will declare thy name. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. That's Christ. And that is your salvation. That Christ is the worshiper of Jehovah. It's your salvation that Christ is the worshiper of Jehovah. 
when the devil comes to you and assaults you with his temptation about your worship and says to you, you know, the worship of God is the most important thing you can ever do. It's why you were created. You were made to worship Him. And I know what you did in church Sunday. I know how drowsy you were. I know how hard it was for you to pay attention. I knew that when you sang all those songs, you thought about three or ten words in the whole psalm. And I know that during prayer your mind wandered all over the place. I know that about you. And when your conscience hears that and trembles, and when your conscience even takes the law of God that was proclaimed to you this morning, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, which means you must worship God the way He commanded, and He commanded you to worship per- perfectly, and the devil in your conscience accuse you, you're not a very good worshiper, and your conscience says, I know it, I know it, I'm not, then your salvation in that attack is that Jesus is the worshiper. Jesus is. Jesus came to church. Jesus sat in church. He stood in the midst of the congregation. And He worshipped God. He did that in His own life, upon the earth. He went to church. And He worshipped God. And He does that now at the right hand of God. He worships Jehovah God. And he worships him perfectly. The Lord Jesus Christ never, never in his life, not as a boy, not as a man, never in his life took the name of God upon his lips without meaning. Taking that name upon his lips in vain. Every time he used the name of God, he used it with all the worship and all the meaning, the infinite meaning that that name has. And every time Jesus sang the songs of Zion to God, He sang those songs perfectly. Never did His mind wander. And He prayed to God, praying perfectly, without any of the foolishness of the heart of us mere men being involved in that praying. The Lord Jesus Christ knew the doctrine and the truth of who God is perfectly. The Lord Jesus Christ is the worshiper. He did all of that perfectly. And He did it for you and instead of you. That's the truth of Jesus as the worshiper. He worshiped God in the midst of the congregation for you and instead of you. Now you try saying that anywhere today and your head will get bit off as antinomian You will be charged with making men careless and profane. But don't listen to that. I don't care what that charge is. The truth of Jesus with regard to the great congregation is that He's the worshiper. He says so. I will declare Thy name. I will sing Thy praise in the midst of the congregation. I will do that. I do that. What you're dealing with there with Jesus as the worshiper is your justification. That's your justification that the holy works that Jesus did and all of the obedience to the law that Jesus performed, He did for you and instead of you. And all of those holy works that He did are counted as yours. And that's the righteousness of God. Perfectly in conformity with the being of God. Jesus as the worshiper worshiped for you and instead of you. And you can take that to the devil. You can take that to your own conscience when you are accused of not being a very good worshiper and you can say, I know it. I know it. But Jesus worshiped perfectly and His perfect worship is counted as mine. And when you stand before the judgment seat of God, now in your own conscience or in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you stand before the judgment seat of God and God says to you, did you worship me? Did you worship me? You don't say to God, 
Well, I went to church twice a Sunday, and there were a lot of people in town that didn't even go once. I went to church twice a Sunday. That's how I worship Thee. And I sang only psalms in the church. There are a lot of churches that don't sing psalms. They sing all kinds of man's nonsense. But I sang the psalms in church. And that was my worship. And I made sure I was in a church where there was the pure gospel preached. And not all of the false doctrine and heresy that's around today. I did all those things. I went to church twice. I sang the psalms. I had the gospel. When God asks you, did you worship me? You don't even begin to say I. You don't say the first thing about what you ever did your whole life. You say, Jesus did. Jesus worshipped. He worshipped perfectly. All His life He worshipped perfectly. He still does now forever and ever. Jesus worships perfectly. And all of that perfect worship of Jesus is mine. It's mine. It's counted as mine. And that's the way the Lord deals with you too with regard to your worship. He doesn't come to you and say, oh, I see how well you've done compared to everyone else. That's good for you. I count that as good for you. God comes to you and He sees Jesus sitting on your right and your left. He sees Jesus in your midst worshiping Him. And He says, oh, Jesus worshiped perfectly. That was right. That was good. And that's what I count for the assembly of my elect as your worship. Isn't that beautiful? Doesn't that set your heart free with regard to the worship of Jehovah? That in all your weakness and sin and mine, you may have the perfect worship of Christ as your own. That's the gospel. That's justification. That's your hope. That's your life. It's that worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now... If you would say to any one of God's assembly of the elect, if you would say to them, no, that means you don't have to come to church and you don't have to sing the psalms and you don't have to hear the gospel and you don't have to do any of that. That member would say to you, God forbid, God forbid you say that to me. God forbid that you say I don't have to worship. I want to. I want to. I'm thankful that the Lord Jesus Christ worshiped for me and instead of me so that none of... My worship is my righteousness. And now I am free to show gratitude to God in the worship of His name. That's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the gospel of the worshiper. What is it that the Lord Jesus Christ does in this worship of the name of Jehovah in the congregation? Jesus says in the first place, in verse 22, I will declare thy name unto my brother." Jesus does that. He declares God's name unto His brethren. The name of God is the whole truth of God. The whole revelation of God. The name of God is mercy. The name of God is righteous. The name of God is long-suffering. The name of God is the covenant-keeping God. The name of God is the Holy One of Israel. The name of God is the I Am that I Am. The name of God is Savior. The name of God is the whole revelation of Jehovah God. And the name of God is Jesus Christ. For in the Lord Jesus Christ, all of the Godhead is revealed. The whole glory of the Godhead shines forth brightly. He is the express image of His person and the brightness of His glory so that knowing Jesus Christ, you know the salvation of God. You know the mercy of God and the righteousness of God. The name of God is the whole truth of God. And that name of God is essentially Jesus Christ. And to declare that name means that Jesus comes to you in the congregation And He says to you with the authority of God Himself and the authority of God's own Word and God's own being, this is God's name. This is God's grace. This is God's loving kindness and His long-suffering. This is His salvation. This is my cross. This is my suffering. This is me crying, Oh my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? The Lord Jesus Christ proclaims officially 
on behalf of God, the name of Jehovah God. That's what's happening in the worship service when the Lord Jesus Christ assembles with His people. He proclaims and declares the name of the Lord. That's what, ha that's what happens in the preaching of the gospel. That's Jesus declaring God's name in the great congregation. That's Jesus saying by His Word, I have loved you with an everlasting love and delivered you by My own wounds from all your sins. That's the Lord Jesus Christ declaring that. It's not a man, not a mere man, but the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. And that too is your salvation. If a man tells you that, who cares? Who cares? How do you know anything about that? But when the Lord Jesus Christ, whose word is powerful, whose word is saving, whose word is divine, comes to you and by His Spirit carries that word into your heart, it saves you. For that Spirit makes that word effectual so that you know the name of God. You know Jesus Christ and all of His saving power. That's Jesus' worship in the congregation. I will declare thy name in the great congregation. And Jesus' worship in the congregation in the text is in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. And as Hebrews 2 shows, what Jesus meant there is I will sing praise to thee. The Lord Jesus Christ in the great congregation sings. He sings the songs of Zion. He sings those psalms. That opens up the whole book of psalms. So that when you read in Psalm 18, I kept the word of the Lord, therefore the Lord rewarded me. I did something, and God paid me for it. When you read that in Psalm 18, you don't try to figure out how you have to do something to earn the reward of righteousness, but you see that as the song of Christ. Christ did something. His hand was clean. His heart was pure. He may ascend into the hill of the Lord. And because His way was right and because He kept the Word of God perfectly, God rewarded Him with all things, a name and a people and power and honor and glory. It's Jesus singing those things. It's not those, those psalms aren't a puzzle anymore for the poor child of God trying to figure out how in the world can I sing this? Jesus sings it. And he says to his church, now you sing that with me. You sing those as my words. And you praise God with those words as my words that I sing to my God. The fact that Jesus sings the Psalms opens up the whole book of the Psalms to the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus does that in the congregation only according to the truth. If a man comes into your pulpit and he teaches a lie, Jesus never said it. Jesus did not say those words. And you may damn those words and condemn those words as heresy and as wicked false doctrine and not be speaking against Christ. Jesus reveals God's name, which is the truth and the pure gospel of salvation by grace alone. And when the church sings something other than the songs of Zion, when she sings a hymn, a hymn made by man, Jesus is not singing that. A whole bunch of people sing that, but not Jesus. That's the principle of psalm singing in the church. The principle of psalm singing is not, first of all, what's the rule? There is a rule, sing the Psalms. But the principle is not, first of all, what's the rule? The principle is this, what does Jesus sing? He only sings His own songs. 
He only sings the songs of Zion. That's what He sings in the great congregation. That was His example in His life. At the Passover, for example, when at the conclusion of the Passover they sang an hymn, that means they sang that portion of the Psalms that was called the hymn of praise to God. It was no man-made hymn, it was a psalm. Jesus sings in the great congregation the psalms. And now why would the church want anything other than the psalms? For her singing. Do you want to waste your time in the worship singing something Jesus isn't singing? At best, it's a waste of time to sing a hymn. And at worst, it is rebellion against Jehovah God to say to His face, you gave us the songs of Jesus, the songs of Zion, but we wrote one that makes us feel better than all those 150 that you wrote. And we're going to sing this one to you. What is your singing as a church? And mine. What better thing, what only thing, to sing but the psalms of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's Him singing in the great congregation. And our hope in all of that is that in whatever our rebellion and disobedience has been in the matter of worship, the Lord Jesus Christ is the worshiper. And now go forward having the worship of Christ as yours and worship Him in gratitude according to His Word. The testimony that the Lord makes by His being in the midst of the congregation is beautiful. You almost cannot take it in. Certainly cannot fathom the depths of it. What is Jesus' testimony? As He sits in the congregation, stands in the congregation in the pulpit, sings in the congregation. What is the testimony that Jesus makes about you? My brethren. My brethren. That's what you are to me. You're my brethren. Can you imagine Jesus saying that? You? The brethren of Christ? Christ, who is the King of kings and Lord of lords? Christ, who did not need you to be happy? Christ, who is the eternal Son of God, come in our flesh? Christ says about you, who are worms and dust, and me, who am nothing, He says, you are my brethren. What does it mean when Jesus says, you are my brother? Well, it means what Hebrews 2 explains it to me. He's not ashamed of you. He's not ashamed of you. He's not ashamed of you who are idolaters, adulterers, murderers, thieves, He's not ashamed of you. If he were ashamed of you, he would tell everyone, I don't know them. Never heard of them. But Jesus tells all men, the whole world, and tells his church, they, they, that assembly of the elect, they are my brethren. I I would have the whole world know it. All men know it. They are my brethren. That church of mine, those elect of mine, I'm not ashamed of them. You can stand in that. You can stand before the face of God. And that fact that Jesus is not ashamed of you. He's not ashamed of you because His blood has covered the sins of all His people. 
He's not ashamed of you because His worship was done for you and instead of you. And all His holy works were done for you and instead of you. So that you are as righteous as God Himself for the sake of Jesus Christ. That's the testimony to go home with. That's the testimony to take into all the affliction and sorrow of this life. Ah, yes! Today again I lose my life. Today I lose my name again. Today I lose all my things again. But the Lord Jesus Christ called me brother. He's not ashamed of me. He never will be. Now we're in the day of judgment. And I am happy in this testimony of the Lord. So look around, congregation. Look around, assembly of the elect. What do you see by faith? There is your Lord, the worshiper, perfect and unashamed his beloved church. To him be the glory. Amen. Our Father which art in heaven, we thank thee for thy word to us this evening. Bless it to our hearts and comfort us by it that we may know Jesus Christ as the perfect worshiper and that all our righteousness may be in him who is not ashamed to call us brethren in whose name we pray. Amen.